Before you're seated, let's lift up our voices. We're going to read this psalm together as it comes up on the screen. Let's read uh, Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. Ready? Here we go. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. When you come under the shelter of God, it's a place of protection, a place where He defends us. And we want to talk about that today. Man, you guys ready for the Word? Pull up a chair. As you pull up a chair, I'm going to start off the message for just a few minutes, and then Pastor Tosh is going to come. We're going to tag team, and then we're going to respond with worship toward the end, and we're going to have communion together. And don't leave early, because right before you get out the door today, I'm going to give you some application points. We're going to call it For Monday. The message that I want to talk to you about is you're going to be better served by it tomorrow morning, Tuesday, Wednesday, than you are in the building right now. Because what I want to talk to you about is your your personal life with the Lord, your one-on-one -on -one time, what the Bible calls the secret place. That's that intimacy. That's that uh, conversation you have that nobody sees. And it was a big part of the life of Jesus. Actually, the way that I got into ministry and started a worship ministry back in the, wow, 80s. Anybody from the 80s? <laughs> Four of us, that's great. Great music and hair back then, I must say. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I came to the Lord, many of you know my story, out, out of a, a real life of brokenness and addiction. And when I, when I got saved, like the week I got saved and recommitted my life to Christ, because I was born in church, I took a time out for many, many years. Um, I was working at a treatment plant in Dillard, Oregon, and I was working swing shift. And so I'd get off work about 11.30 or midnight, drive back into town. And my dad was a pastor, and we had this old Presbyterian concrete building with stained glass and we went in there and had Pentecostal church for sure but I had a key to the building and what I did after work every night is I go to the building from midnight to about two or three in the morning and I just spend time alone with the Lord nobody knew I just had the key there's a piano in there I'd bang away on or a guitar or whatever and, and I would read my Bible and pray now I wasn't doing that because I was spiritual I wasn't doing that because I was like some high-level Christian. I was doing that because I was a jacked-up mess in desperate need of redemption. Anybody with me? I was doing it out of necessity. No one said, hey, bro, you should probably pray and read the Bible a couple hours a day or you're not going to make it. I just knew I wasn't going to make it without having a secret place experience. And out of that experience came... Um, and those moments of hiding away with God came a desire to do something for God. In, a, in other words, the public ministry of my life came out of the secret place relationship with Jesus, and it's been that way for 35 years. So I want to ask you today, what is coming out into the light, in the fruition of your life that people see that's a result of your secret place relationship with Jesus? Who are you when nobody's watching? What's your prayer life like when nobody hears it but God? That's what we're talking about today. And I, I think some of this content is really going to help you. There's an invitation connected with some great promises regarding the secret place. Look at this in Psalm 31. How great is the goodness you've stored up for those who fear you. That is to worship and to reverence and to stand in awe of God. You lavish it on those who come to you. Time out. The initiative is on you. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Seek him, you'll find him. Search for him, you'll discover him. Knock, the door is open. You know the drill. So those who come uh, to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world, you hide them in the secret place. That's the shelter of your presence. Safe from those who conspire against them, you shelter them in your presence far from the accusing tongues. Now, this is quite profound and quite simple. And Jesus gave us a key to know God in such a way, no one can take this away from you. This is simply between you and him. It's very personal. But you have a guarantee that you're going to meet with the Father. Because I, I, I bet there's people in the room, you just feel distant from God. You know, I talk to folks that the only time they actually experience the presence of God or a worship atmosphere is when they walk into these rooms we gather in. Which is great, and this corporate gathering is, is something that God has designed, the band, the worship, the standing, the preaching, all biblical, and it's very effective. But your Christian experience should not begin and end within the context of the walls of a weekend church service. Are you guys hearing me today? 
that there's, there's actually a place where you can step away from the noise and the distraction and build your life in the secret place. And here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. He said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may seem, be seen by men. That's basically what a lot of times religion does. It's just as long as someone sees me, I get a pat on the back, check the box. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door. Everybody say, shut the door. Shut the door. One more time with some attitude. Shut the, shut the door. Your father, who is where? I, I want you to see this. It's a revelation for some of you. Your father, who is in, he's in the secret place. In other words, the implication is he's already there before you get there. He will meet you in secret, and he will reward you openly. Don and I recently sold our home, and we were going to transition to another place, and it didn't quite work out. So as of now, we're homeless. If you guys kind of spare bedroom, see me after church. But <laughs> homeless is cool. It's a sense of dependency, and you're light on your feet. But anyway, we're staying with some friends. And my office right now is kind of like this little 10 by 10 room, and that's where I study and prepare to meet with you guys on the weekend. And you know, I've got my computer so I can do research, and my music in there, and a guitar, and my Bible and a few books, but here's what I know. I, I commit early mornings to the Lord. I wasn't always like that, but I'm on this thing now where the early morning hours, I want to awaken the dawn with my song. And so I go meet with the Lord early in the morning. And first thing in the morning that I do, very spiritual, is first I hit the button on the coffee machine. How many know that's, that's Bible right there? Right? You know it is. Don't forget Hebrews. Okay. <laughs> I know. The old preacher jokes are the best. Get over it. So he brews, and then he goes into the office, and, um, and here's the deal. When I go in there, and I shut the door, the worship music starts, and he is there. Some days it's by faith. Some days there's more revelation. Some days I sense his presence, and I weep in his presence, but he is always there in the secret place. That is where your heavenly Father is. I want to challenge you, if you've never done this, to develop a secret place. If you don't have a location, uh, if you haven't identified an undistracted space where you can shut the door, I'm going to challenge you to do that today. And then once you've shut the door, begin to eliminate distraction in your life. One of the greatest enemies of your prayer life, your worship life, your secret life with the Lord is the distraction all around you, especially digital distraction. You know, we live in a culture right now of media and phones and your whole world's on your phone. I get it. But there is so much digital distraction. There's been a lot of research done. There's a great book out by, I think it's Cal Newport, called Digital Minimalism, which is a great read. And the big idea is this, that choose a focused life in a distracted world. I think that's a great word for all of us. Jesus showed us how to do this, to live a focused life. New research shows the average person checks their phone between 200 and 500 times every single day. Some of you have checked your phone a couple times since you've been in this building. And it's just, it's our addiction. And scrolling, there's an endorphin rush that's released, or video games, and checking the likes. You know, you get, you get this digital rush that happens, but it actually causes distraction. And there's a lot of research that's been done, but I'll give you one quote from Robin Sharma that I love. An addiction to distraction is the death of your creative production. Think about that. An addiction to distraction is the death of your creative production. Did you know that multitasking is actually a fictional concept? Some people say, oh, I'm a great multitasker. You're not. <laughs> You're just distracted with several things. You may be juggling flaming swords, but the neuroscience has proven that in order to set your focus on one thing, you have to look away from something else. So there is no multitasking. That's why so many people wreck when they try to text and drive, right? But you are created to be a one-thing person, to focus your eyes and your attention. And you know that historically, the great thinkers, the great innovators, the great artists and musicians and geniuses and creators have all practiced isolation and time alone. And this is a, is a God concept. This is something that God has designed you for. You know, Thomas Edison, perhaps one of the greatest... Uh, creative minds and inventors in history, he probably is, because he had over 1,000 patents to his credit, one of those being the invention of the light bulb. How many know that must have been a great day? And, and you've probably heard the stats. He had over 1,000 failures at creating a light bulb before he succeeded. 
And so can you imagine, he calls his assistant and he says, hey, come here, come here, check this out. He's all excited. He says, look at that. And he goes, what's that? A little glass orb. Oh, he goes, I call it a light bulb. What's it do? Watch this. <laughs> and history's forever changed. But the reason that he created the light bulb is he spent copious amounts of time in focused isolation. There's something that will happen in your life when you push back distraction. I want to challenge you. What are the distracting features of your life? You know, last week, Pastor Rich and I spoke a message on breakthrough and the God of breakthrough. And I prayed this over our pastors this week. We prayed it out at Pursuit. And I want to share this idea with you because I believe it's true of all of us. I think there's a breakthrough version of you that you haven't seen yet. I think there's some untapped genius in this room. I think there's some creative ideas and songs and books and businesses and plans and great things that are locked up in the hearts of God's people. But we're so busy checking our phone and our email and our video games and our Instagram feeds and running here and there. If we would just get alone and say, God, I'm going to silence the crowd. I'm, I'm going to shut the door. I'm going to wait on you. So I want to encourage you, find a designated place. Find an undistracted space and spend some focused time and see what God will release in your life. Are you guys getting this today? This is what we're talking about, the secret place. And we learn this from Jesus. Look at the, the lifestyle of Jesus here, Mark 1.35. This was his pattern. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house, and here's the key. He went off to a solitary place where he prayed. The secret place of the Most High God. Let's talk about it. Would you welcome up Pastor Tasha? Come talk about how Jesus lived life. Here we go. Hey, we're going to jump straight in today. Uh, how many of you know when we come into atmospheres of worship, you know, like this, where we're at, wherever you're at location-wise, we all have an image in our mind of who Jesus is, right? We walk in. Some of us, you know, we see this like super mass of light, very distant. We think, you know, well, we're worshiping him, but can he hear us? I don't know. I mean, some of you will come in and maybe you have that image of Jesus in your grandma's hallway, you know, in the frame growing up, long blonde hair, blue eyes, Gucci loafers, you know, playing shuffleboard with some white kids by the beach. Some of us have this image of Jesus because of what you know we've seen or what's been portrayed, but we all have this image in our mind of who Jesus is. And as you begin to read the gospels, as you read through the Bible, and you see how Jesus was a human, Jesus was fully God, but he was fully man. And he came to this earth as a baby. He came as a human being. He had a human intellect, human freedoms. He knew what it felt like to be tempted. He knew hunger pains. He knew what it was like to be thirsty. Jesus, fully God, but fully man, living on this earth, experiencing the things that we experience. This is a crazy concept. I don't know if you've thought about it much, but it's crazy to think that our Savior knew what it felt like, knew what it was like to feel emotions and feelings, knew what it felt like to feel anxiety and anger and passion enjoy Jesus himself. He experienced all of these things. And while he walked on this earth, there were three years before he uh, went to the cross that he, had, he was in his ministry and he was busy. Jesus' life was full. He had a lot going on. He was preaching. He was teaching. He was going from city to city. He was healing people. He had critics. He had people judging him. He had the religious crowd. Jesus was all over the map and he had stuff going on all the time and people wanting and taking from him. And in Luke 5, 516, it says, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness to pray. Another translation says, as often as possible, Jesus withdrew to out of the way places for prayer. Jesus lived a lifestyle of going to the secret place, as Pastor Dave was talking about. Jesus modeled this for us in big moments and before moments and in the middle of moments of Jesus's life. He would go off and pray to the Father. Before he fed the 5,000, where's Jesus? He's on a boat praying to the Father. You know the disciples are like, where is Jesus? And then after he feeds the 5,000, one of the most legit miracles in the canon of scripture, where's Jesus? On a mountainside, just praying to the Father. Like, what is he doing? And then there were times where Jesus would stay up all night long just praying and waiting on the Father. Before he chose the 12 disciples, he was up on a hilltop, just waiting on the Lord, listening for his voice, and praying to the Father. 
And there were times where he would go to the garden. The garden was one of those familiar places for Jesus where he would go often and he would pray before one of the biggest moments of our lives, his life, our history, the crucifixion, where was Jesus? He was in the garden praying to the Father. Jesus withdrew to the secret place because he knew in order to be sustained on the journey, he had to get away with the Father. And another reason why is because he was modeling for his disciples and he was modeling for us, the believers, how to live a lifestyle of going to the secret place often. Withdrawing to the secret place is what sustained Jesus' life. And in Matthew 28, Jesus says this, are you tired? He's talking to us. Worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. And the Passion Translation, it says, I will refresh your life for I am your oasis. I love that. I'm your oasis. Jesus is saying he's our oasis. What's that? It's water in the desert place. Jesus is saying, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burdened by all the cares of this life? Are you just going from one thing to the next? Are you done with religion? What should we do? We should come to him. He says, come to me, all of you. He's saying, anybody, come to me. And his promise is, is that he is going to refresh us, give us rest. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And he makes it so simple. He, showed, he literally came to this earth to show us how simple it was. And just walk off. Jesus, or the Jesus speaking to the Father, he just go on, a, on the side of a hill. Wherever the distractions of life were put aside, Jesus would go off and speak to the Father. He made it so simple, so easy for us to apply this in our lives. But here's the thing. As believers, why don't we go there as often as we could or as we should? And I want to ask you this question today. What is keeping you personally from going to the secret place often? And there's a long list of things. I'm sure right now you could think of 100 things right off the top of your head that would keep you from going to the secret place. And I just want to throw out a few to you. If it hits home with you, take it. If not, wait for the next one. But the first one would be this, sin. Are you living in unrepented sin? And I'm not talking about the obvious sins. I mean, if you murder someone or you commit adultery or you cheat or you lie or you steal, that's pretty obvious. Like, you know right away, like, that's probably not a good idea. But there are the hidden, the subtle sins in our life, and they begin to separate us from the nearness of God. Because sin, it literally separates us from Jesus himself. So we go to, go to the secret place or we try to go meet with him, and it's like, Huh? Okay, I guess this is what they said to do, but I'm not, I'm not sensing anything. I don't feel anything. And sin can separate us from his presence, from his nearness. So if there's subtle sins or the hidden things in your emotions, your desires, unbelief, jealousy, all these things, they entangle us and they keep us separated from him. And if those things are in your life and you feel like, man, I just don't sense him like I could, repent. It's as simple as that. We repent. Repentance means you lay down all the stuff that's separating you from Jesus and you turn towards him. You walk away from that stuff. Here's the thing. It's not a one-time event. It's not a Sunday morning thing. It's an everyday lifestyle. Every single morning waking up and be like, I messed up. I got all kinds of issues, Jesus. I was born into iniquity. So would you wash me clean? Would you purify my mind? I lay it all before you every single day. You should just roll out of bed, hit the ground and be like, Jesus, I repent. Because we are messed up folks and we need the repentance in our life to be a lifestyle not just a one-time event so get that sin dealt with and come close to Jesus the second one would be this maybe you don't know how to go to the secret place maybe you're new to faith you're new to the team and you you're just getting started or maybe you grew up in a religion where it was rules and regulations and you had to climb this ladder in order to be with Jesus I want to tell you today Jesus made it simple as I said boats mountaintops hillsides gardens Wherever you can go and get away from the distractions of your life and focus on the King of Kings, there he is. As Pastor Dave said, Matthew 6, 6, shut the door, meaning shut all the distractions, and there he is. Pray to the Father who is there with you. 
This is a promise from Jesus. He's with us in the secret place. Why are we not running as fast as we possibly can? Pray to the Father who's there with you. And further on in that chapter, he goes on to, to say how not to pray. He says, don't just bring empty words and just religious talk. You know, some thou saith the Lord, thou ha, ha, ha. You don't even know what you're saying. You're just like, I don't know, I heard somebody say this before. I guess this is what we do. Or you're just bringing empty, oh, I pray for the cat's surgery on Tuesday and the dentist appointment, Laura. Okay, done, and we're just emptying out just nothing. No, have a conversation with Jesus. Get real with him. Tell him what's going on in your heart. He already knows what you need before you need it, but sometimes it's good just to tell him, God, I'm going through this. I give it to you. I surrender to you. I repent. God, I want to know you. You just lay it before him, and then here's the thing. You just wait. Wait in his presence. Psalm 46, 10 says, be still and know that I am God. That's what some of us need. We just need to be still in his presence and remind our soul that he is God. Another one is maybe you feel unworthy. Maybe it's been a long time since you had this secret place. Maybe it's been a while since you really went away and you talked with Jesus. Maybe you just feel like, man, he's not going to come close. He's not going to receive me or he's not going to hear my prayers. I mean, it's been years. Maybe it's been decades. I don't know if I can go back to that place. I just, I don't feel worthy enough. That is a lie of the enemy. You, there's no track record that Jesus is keeping score of how well you're doing. Oh, they've gone to church this much. Oh, they've been to the secret place this much. No, it is all by his grace that he invites us in. He says we boldly come in. We approach his throne. How? By grace, by mercy, by his grace and mercy. It's nothing that you can earn on your own. It's nothing that you can achieve or do in your own strength. It's all by the grace of Jesus. So if you today have been feeling just like distant and unsure and separated and you just feel like, I can't go in, man, I'm so messed up. I've done so much bad stuff. I, God wouldn't even want to be near me. That's a lie from me. All you got to do is you got to draw near again. Just take a step forward and what you're going to realize is as you do that, he comes near. There's a nearness that happens and the separation begins to disappear. And the last thing I want to talk about is this offense. Some of you, and maybe ask yourself this question today, are you offended with God because of something you thought he was going to do and he didn't do it? Are you disappointed with Jesus? It's kind of a sober question. But disappointment and offense, it actually hardens our hearts towards the nearness and the presence of God. It separates us, it creates a wedge between us and his holiness and his presence and the, the secret place becomes a distant thing and we end up not going there very often when we have offense and bitterness and disappointment. I know this hits home for me a few years back, probably six or seven years ago. My uh, sweet little grandma, she was like five feet tall, adorable, sassy, opinionated, but the encourager, woman of God. I mean, the reason why we are in Vacaville with the father's house is because she lived here and we were in a, a transition time as a family. And so we lived with her for nine months and then voila, the father's house started. So she really planted the church basically. Uh, but she was the best. She was my best friend. I spent a lot of years, my younger years with her while she was in days of being single. She would have me over and we would, we just had such a bond. She was a best friend. I could talk to her about anything. She was always encouraging me. We just had a very special relationship relationship. Even when uh, I got proposed by my amazing husband, Joseph, where was grandma? Right beside me. <laughs> she was there when I got proposed to. Like, we just had a really, really close rela relationship. She was the best person in my life, and I would spend so much time with her. But she started going through this battle with cancer for about five years, and she was going through chemo and all these different things, and really taking a toll on her body. And towards the end, when she was young. She was in her early 60s, and uh, she was really struggling, and the cancer was getting aggressive, and it had come back in a different place and was really spreading, and it, it, was, it was an intense time. But I remember being like, no, Jesus has this. Like, he is good, and he's going to heal her. And my whole life, the secret place wasn't just something that we talk about. It was my life. As a teenager, I would spend hours upon hours in the secret place, not to boast of myself, but because I knew outside of this, I am messed up. But inside the presence of Jesus, everything makes sense. So for me, my relationship with Jesus was strong. I knew his faithfulness. I had devoted every day of my life, my purity, everything to him. Like he, I just gave him everything. I trusted him. There was no doubt. There was nothing. I mean, I would stay up at night and pray for my grandma. And you know, the Bible says if you have faith, 
faith of a mustard seed. Mine was like Mount Everest. I was like, I know you're going to do it. I'm crying. I'm rebuking tumors and seeing visions in my mind of her being healed. And I'm just, no, God, you're faithful. You're good. You're going to heal her. Well, a couple of weeks had passed, and she ended up passing away and going to be with Jesus. And you guys, I remember the day that I got the phone call. I was sitting at my dining room table. I was about five months pregnant with our second son, and my oldest is a toddler running all over the kitchen. And I'm sitting there at the dining room table, and I just remember putting my head down on the kitchen table and feeling this separation in my heart from Jesus. And it was nothing that I was intentionally doing. It was nothing that he was doing. I just began to feel this like, whoa, what, what is happening? And as weeks went by and months went by, I began to just feel the separation and the distance increase. And it was like, I wasn't mad at Jesus. I wasn't throwing my fist at him and angry that my, you know, 63-year-old grandma had to go to heaven. I wasn't running away from the church or getting upset. I was confused and I was unsure and I was still doing all the things that I once knew to do. I was leading worship still. I was the worship pastor. If that brings fear into anybody's hearts, I'm sorry. I was a mom. I was, a, you know, a wife. I was doing life. I was doing what I knew to do. But the, the secret place had become distant for me. And going away to be with God, it started to become something that was like, oh, I don't know. And I would still try to read my Bible. And even in worship settings in the church, I would worship him, but I felt so distant. I felt so far away and just confused, almost like I wanted to turn away from his presence, from his nearness. And this started, you know, it went on for a few months. And I remember I was sitting in my living room with piles of laundry all around, all the mothers can relate, toddlers everywhere, <laughs> clothes everywhere. And I was reading this book and this one line, I don't remember what the book said, I don't remember what the line or what, what the context was, but the line said, in order to be blessed by God, you have to release your offense. And I remember seeing that word offense and it pierced me straight in the heart. And I remember I fell on my knees in my living room and I just began to break. I began to realize that it wasn't, that I was mad at him. It wasn't that I hated him. I was offended with God. I had an expectation that he was going to do something, and he didn't end up following through like I thought he was going to. I was disappointed. I was confused. And right there in my living room, nobody, no band, no pastor, no church service. I wasn't even singing a song. I got on my knees in the middle of the laundry, and I just began to talk to Jesus. And for a first time in quite a while, a few months had passed, I began to talk to Jesus for real. And it had been some time, and so, you know, it's that awkward coming back in, like, Jesus. And I just began to just break down because I realized that this offense had created this wedge in between me and him, in between me and his nearness. I wasn't coming to him as often as I should have or as I could have, I was living in this broken place and I just got on my knees. I just began to pray to Jesus. I just said, God, I don't understand. I am so confused. God, I thought I knew who you were. I thought I could trust you. And God, I'm upset. I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated in this situation. But God, here's the deal. I need you. I can't go on on my own. God, I'm, I'm confused in my human thinking and I know there's mystery involved with this journey in the Christian faith. But God, I need you you right now and the separation that has been between us. God, I lay it down now. God, I lay this offense down now. God, I lay the unbelief down now. God, and I want to trust you again. But Jesus, I need you to heal me. I need you to come close again. I need you to remind me of who you are. And as I sat there, I I felt, I didn't get some hand of God on my head or, you know, an angel walked in the room, but I could feel deep in my heart as I just waited on him and I was just bawling my eyes out and stuff was breaking off of me, I could just sense the Holy Spirit come close and I just heard him say, I was with you the whole time. I never separated myself from you. I never walked away from you. Even when you doubted, even when you thought you were supposed to be full of faith and your faith was gone, I was still beside you. In the midst of the confusion, in the midst of the lies of the enemy, I never left you. I never abandoned you. But this offense and this hardening of the heart 
It had separated me from him. And I know today in all locations, wherever you're watching, there's things in life that happen that we don't understand. There's stuff that goes on. And guess what the enemy wants us to do? He wants us to run away from the secret place. He wants to, us to run outside of the oasis, outside of the water source and the refreshing. And he wants us to get disillusioned and distracted from all these other things and go far, far away from where Jesus is. But in all reality, where else can we go? For me, if I would have kept running, God knows where I'd be right now and I'd be, be hard hearted and bitter and twisted. But there's something about running to him and just in a full abandon and surrender and saying, Jesus, I don't understand. God, I don't understand your ways. But what I do know is that you are good and you are true. And right here where we live on this earth is just a small window of time. We're living for eternity. We're living for something bigger. My grandma's having a party up in heaven right now cheering us all on but right here in this moment while we're here in the face of the world and darkness and confusion and lies I will be found right here in the secret place with Jesus with my eyes on him gazed on his beauty this is where I want to be found sometimes he doesn't speak when you're there Sometimes it feels a little bit dull, but it's never in vain. When you go to be with Jesus, when you shut the door of distractions, when you set aside time and you live a lifestyle of the secret place, it's never in vain. And there's those moments that are life-changing encounters when Jesus shows up, like he did in my living room. And he reminds me, I never left your side. This isn't it. Wherever you're at in your journey right now, this isn't it for you. There's so much more that Jesus wants to whisper to your heart, the vision and the hope and the future that he has for you. There is more than this. And you need to be reminded, if you've just been going through religious routines and just the day-to-day -day and, oh gosh, and the burdens of life, stop running away from him and start running toward him. Get away with him. If you feel like there's sin that has separated you, repent and deal with it. If you feel like you're unworthy, break off the lies. He welcomes you close. And and if you're offended and disappointed, lay it before him and let that wedge, let the walls that separate you, let them just crash down and just walk back into the presence of Jesus again and let him speak to you. Let him do whatever it is he wants to do. Our responsibility is just to come and wait. His responsibility is to speak and do whatever it is he wants to do. But we got to be found there, church. We got to make it a priority. Don't keep running. Don't keep wasting time. Just get back to that place, draw near again. Because I honestly don't know how you live the Christian journey without the secret place. I don't know how you would go through trials of life and face all this stuff and just, well, this is what we do. No, there's such a refreshing, like it says in Matthew 11, that he comes and he refreshes us and he lifts off the burdens and he lifts off the cares and he brings healing into the places that you don't even realize need to be healed. And one last thing, maybe today, there's that offense, there's that disappointment. And even as I'm saying it, like I did with the book, when I read it, I was like, I didn't even realize I was offended with God. Maybe you're having that revelation this morning and you're realizing like, wow, there's been some stuff, broken relationships. Maybe the, the wife never came, the job never happened, the kids fell away from God, whatever, tragedy. And you realize that you, in those moments, you distrust came and you began to just separate a little bit at a little bit at a time. And today, God is reminding you that he is close and all you gotta do is come. All you gotta do is run to him. And we're gonna respond this morning with a song that I believe is just, it just speaks at least what's in my heart and I believe it'll speak to yours as well. And I don't want this to be a performance or like I'm singing a special. I want you in this moment, if you need to close your eyes, if you need to take some time right now just to set your focus on Jesus, we're gonna have the back half of, of uh, the service and we're going to worship a little bit more but just in this song I just want us to respond to Jesus at every location wherever you're at in the prisons right now just close your eyes and just just respond to Jesus today church he's close he wants to walk through this room he wants to whisper to your heart and your mind and I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions, I'm sorry. When I just sing another song, 
So take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you Oh, I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're in love So take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you Jesus And I'm caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment And I never want to leave Oh, cause I'm not here for blessings And Jesus, you don't owe me to him today oh I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry when I just sang another song so take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you When I forgot the you're in earth So take me back to where we started God, I open up my heart to you We open up again, Lord Oh, cause I'm caught up in your presence Oh, and I just want to sit caught up in this holy moment and I never want to leave oh Jesus oh cause I'm not here for blessings oh Jesus you don't owe me Nothing else, and nothing else, and nothing else will do. I just want, come on, tell them today. And nothing else, no love, and nothing else, and nothing else will do. Cause I just want you, yeah, and nothing else.
Pray today. Move. 